future. History has been defined in the Merriam-Webster dictionary as a branch of knowledge that records and explains past events. As a direct result, I no longer believe anything I read in the dictionary. All our lives, the so-called experts have been feeding us so-called facts about so-called history, despite a myriad of evidence to the contrary. I don't know if it's all a result of some kind of conspiracy propagated by our reptilian Illuminati overlords or what, but just thank you lucky stars that you've got us to set the record straight. I'm Peter from WhatCulture.com and here are 10 historical facts that simply aren't true. Number 10. George Washington did not have wooden dentures. Now it is true that America's first president did have some pretty major issues with his grill. In Washington's day, dental hygiene was mediocre at best, and old Georgie was at an extra disadvantage after being treated for smallpox with mercury oxide, which makes a right royal mess of pretty much everything. As a result, by the time he became president, Washington had lost all but one of his gnashes, and so wore a set of false teeth that he'd had made. However, here's where the high school history book goes out the window, only to be replaced by old mother George George's pocketbook of nightmares. His dentures were not made out of wood, as many sources would have you believe. Rather, they were made from an assorted collection of teeth that he'd had procured from different African-American slaves. One can only imagine how mismatched and wonky they must have been. It wouldn't surprise me if a whole generation of children were told that if they didn't go to sleep before midnight, President Washington would come out of the wardrobe and chew on their bones. That said, records do show that once he made it to office, he was in a position to chuck out his creepy as hell choppers in favour of a set made from, what else? hippopotamus and elephant ivory, and small gold springs. It's how the 1% live, guys. God bless America. Number 9. The Salem Witches Weren't Burnt at the Stake The old saying goes, Beef, sir, is hung, men are hanged. And as it turns out, so are Salem Witches. Yeah, the perhaps merciful truth behind the tragic executions of nearly two dozen innocent men and women in 17th century Massachusetts is that they typically suffered a relatively quick death by hanging rather than being burnt alive. The one exception was 81-year-old Giles' absolute badass Corey, who was killed by a torture method called pressing, which entailed being crushed by heavy stones. He reportedly didn't cry out during the entire process, and when asked three times to plead to his charge of witchcraft, simply replied, More weight. At which point the executioner cut out the middleman, chucked a bucket of water onto his face, and he melted into the floor. That's a lie. Number 8. Hitler didn't have only one testicle. Still recounted by British school children to this day, the old wartime propaganda song, of which there are many variations, goes that Hitler has only got one ball, the other is in the Albert Hall. Now, I've been to the Albert Hall, and recall no such exhibit, but that's almost certainly because Hitler actually had both of his balls. He just happened to hold one of them a little closer to his heart. Literally. Information released by historian Peter Fleischmann in 2015 reveals that Hitler was given a medical examination following his 1927 arrest after the Beer Hall Putsch, and was noted to have right side crypt orchidism, or an undescended right testicle. In other words, he definitely had two, but only one of them could be seen hanging down by his little dictator. Number 7. Napoleon was not short. From one historical leader who may well have had something to compensate for, to another who has been unfairly linked with the male inferiority complex for 200 years. Napoleon Bonaparte was by no means a short bloke for his time, standing at around 5 feet and 6 or 7 inches tall. Of course, by modern standards, that's not a dimension one might necessarily brag about, but given that the average height of a European man at the time was around 5 foot 5, Napoleon had a whole extra inch and a half with which to tower over his 19th century enemies. The confusion may well have arisen due to a difference between the British inch and the French pouce, which was a touch longer. But whatever the reason, it's simply incorrect that to this day, a person with small man syndrome can be said to have a Napoleon complex. The French emperor was definitely a size does matter kind of guy. Number 6. Abe Lincoln wasn't fighting to end slavery. One commonly accepted historical fallacy that may come as a surprise to those of you who've studied the American Civil War in reasonable depth is the notion that Lincoln's ultimate goal during the conflict was to put a stop to the horrors of slavery. The fact of the matter is that Abe was actually more concerned with unifying the states in a more general sense. In fact, Lincoln literally said in an 1862 letter to the New York Tribune, If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. Of course, President Lincoln was inherently against slavery, and I'm not trying to argue otherwise. However, if you want to split hairs over the Union's motives, the fact is that they were fighting to unify the country whatever the cost. For want of a much less trivialising term, the abolition of slavery was actually a byproduct, though probably the greatest ever political byproduct in history. 
Number 5. Nero didn't fiddle while Rome burned The claim that Nero fiddled while Rome burned is wrong for so many reasons, not least that it sounds like a line from an antiquity-themed carry-on film. Be your sire. What are you doing with your thing? The Great Fire of Rome burned for eight days in July 64 AD, and some historians would have you believe that Emperor Nero started the blaze himself with the intention of rebuilding the city in his own image, and then perched on his balcony playing the fiddle while people below him choked and burned. Now, the fiddle wasn't even invented until the 10th century, so that's a sticking point from the get-go, to say the least. But Nero did apparently play the liar, so perhaps there's some truth to the matter. Well, no. According to Tacitus, who was a highly reliable historian of the time, Nero wasn't even in the city when the fire broke out. He was actually at his villa in Antium some 30 miles away. Of course, it's very possible that Nero ordered someone else to start the fire in his stead while he fiddled or liared away in his villa, but there's certainly no truth to the notion that he actually watched the carnage unfold from his palace window playing Nero my god to thee. Anyone who says otherwise is a liar. Sorry. Number 4. Vincent van Gogh might not have cut off his own ear Poor old Vinny was a tortured soul, posthumously diagnosed with various possible conditions including schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, poisoning from his paints, syphilis or temporal lobe epilepsy. The notion that he cut off his own ear then is not too difficult for many people to swallow. However, that might not be the case. As if Vincent didn't have enough on his plate, what with his mental health and his lack of success as an artist, he also had a quote-unquote friend named Paul! who, as a keen fencer, may well have ended up accidentally chopping off Van Gogh's ear in a scuffle. Historians Hans Kaufmann and Rita Wildegans theorise in their book Pact of Silence that upon hearing Paul's plans to leave town, Vincent became upset and began to fight his friend, losing an ear as a result. They believe that the original story of Van Gogh chopping off the ear himself that night contained inconsistencies, and the reason Vincent never came out with the truth was that he couldn't bear to lose his friend. God bless you, Vinny. I said God bless you... Oh, he can't hear me. Number three, we don't know what the gladiatorial thumb signs meant. Historical accounts are simply not clear on the exact manner in which the emperor or the crowd decided someone else's fate, police verso, or with a turned thumb, as it was known. A quote on gladiators by Roman writer Decimus Juvenal goes that they hold shows of their own and win applause by slaying whomsoever the mob with a turn of the thumb bids them slay which is decidedly unspecific on the exact gestures used. Some historians claim that it could have been the other way around to what we're used to, or that it possibly entailed slipping the thumb inside a clenched fist. The fact of the matter is that despite Hollywood's best attempts to convince you that thumbs down meant death, and thumbs up probably meant death some other day of the week, and assorted smug contrarians' insistence that it was actually the other way around, anyone who thinks they know for sure, one way or the other, is simply wrong. Number two, the SS weren't all Aryans. In fact, they weren't even all German. Certainly to begin with, members of Hitler's Schutzstaffel had to provide proof of pure Aryan ancestry, leading to the popular notion that they were all bonny, blonde-haired and blue-eyed boys. However, as the war raged on, Adolf gradually bled the country dry of so-called master race members, and the SS first had to resort to non-Germans, and then to men of non-Aryan descent entirely. Indeed, by 1945, 60% of SS soldiers were non-German. It's said that it was actually a French SS regiment who defended the Führer's Berlin bunker in the last days of the war. Man, getting your enemies to defend your bunker as the Russians close in, that takes balls. At least two balls. Number one, the Declaration of Independence was not passed on the 4th of July. Sorry to spoil the illusion for you, but it's generally accepted by experts that this didn't happen on the 4th of July. Many historians now agree that the terms of the declaration were finalised on the 2nd of July, and the actual signing didn't take place on the 2nd or the 4th. In fact, the average American historian believes that the physical signing of the document didn't happen until around the 2nd of August. Nice one. Thanks for letting everyone know, pal. You had one job. And on that calendar-altering bombshell, that is our list. Let us know what we missed out in the comments below. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. I'm Peter from whatculture.com, and I'll see you soon.